All right, let me just pull this stuff up since I'm getting distracted. Um, who was it in here, or maybe it's more, even more than one of you, who has taken um, micro, at least partially, at Stillwater? Yes. Would you, and I'm not trying to like put anything out, but I, you are one of four students now who has told me about that class being basically like a terms and like some homework that is the same as the test. Yeah. Um, I had students in the may or may not have been the section with the, the girl that we sometimes talk about. Um, and she has a friend in the, in the class who um, two students in that class alone were talking about it. One of them has taken the class and there's the girl whose friend is taking it. And, and she was one that complained and said to me, why can't we have easy questions on our exams like they do in Stillwater? And there isn't much that's going to get me much more angry than saying something like that to me. Because I literally looked her in the face and I said, honey, that was the easy exam. Like, <laughs> that's what I said to her. But then I got mad. And then I was like, okay, well, listen, like, what now that I have calmed down about this? I think what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do a bad or anything, but I am probably going to contact um, OSU Stillwater and figure out what's going on with their micro program. Because why is it so wildly different from other places? Not just here, right? We, yes, I, I want to hear about this. I think that, like, this is kind of my thoughts on it. I think that here at uh, OSU OBC is so, like, nursing oriented and, like, we get deeper into micro because we see them in micro culture spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that since that OS, and I don't know if this is just here either, but I know that Stillwater, they have like a micro program where you can like get your degree in microbiology. I think that since it's like an intro course to micro, it's so like easy to like yeah. get through it. So I want to make this part clear too, because this is the other thing that I told them. I When I went to OSU, I was a microbiology major first. And so when I took this course, literally this course at micro at uh, OSU Stillwater, it was way more difficult than I'm teaching it. It was one of those classes like I've been talking about and people think I'm just blowing smoke out my ass and I'm really not. Like it really was one of those classes with like lecture and here's your test. Good luck, you failed, must've been your fault, sort of things. So it was like, when I heard your story, I was like, what? Like that is, but I wanna be clear. When I took microbiology at OSU Stillwater, some of you guys are gonna like, like full on pass out when I say this, but when I took microbiology at OSU Stillwater, that was 21 years ago. So I was in college 21 years ago at OSU Stillwater taking this course. So it was a very different time. Um, this isn't like old person saying that. I mean, things really do, like you'll see when you get older. That's the thing I can say now. Um, <laughs> things really do change. They really do over time, especially when you have something like COVID come along. And I feel like that's a big part of the changes that we've seen. But having said that, um, things were different then. Like they were very, because they were a micro program and you were taking it for micro, they expected you to know your shit. Like it was, that's how it was. Now it's like, uh, you'll make it through this. You'll get to the harder classes and prove, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Now I think that's kind of what it is. But I also feel like all of the classes are kind of like that. Like, it's like you get there and they'll say it about micro and then they'll say it about the next class. Like, uh, yeah, whatever, you'll, you'll get there. It's like, you just pass this class and get through it. It's whatever. And that's kind of how it's become. Because everybody's gotten super lazy as a result of wanting to adapt to COVID. And this is the truth. And we've all seen it. We've all kind of been there and lived it. Um, so this isn't me trying to be mean to them, but if you can tell me, like, just email me your professor's name or something, or, and if this isn't me getting in trouble, like, no, with I, them, I or, that's enough. I can probably just Google that. It'll be enough. But just so I can get in contact with them, I'm probably going to do it in a polite way, you know, nice person way. I'm like, hey, you know, I teach at OSU. Yeah, basically, I teach at OSU. Uh, okay, see, I can be nice. If, I can pretend. <laughs> So I'll probably do it that way um, it in an approach of like focusing on how can I make our classes more similar? Because here's the thing that I'm concerned about. If you go take micro right now with OSU Stillwater, it is vastly different than how you take it here because it really is from what, not just your experience, but other people in my other classes have said, it's, a, it's just like not even learning anything anymore. Yeah. Also, you don't take your lab with micro. Right, you take it separately as a different <laughs> course. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly how it was with the other student that was in that other class. Um, and then apparently, like the, the you know the girl of, of interest, her friend that is taking it in Stillwater, like legitimately, um, they're 
like lab questions were things like, what do you wear in a lab and stuff like that, which is not an unfair question, but like at the same time, I'm like, okay, a few, a few easy questions, but like, what are people learning anything in this class? Like, I'm just, I wonder, um, to be fair, lab classes are often taught by TA in four-year universities. So it's not even typically even overseen by um, the faculty. So just yeah. FYI, yeah, I know. It is it's they're late. The faculty are lazy. Yeah, they, <laughs> they what they would say if you were to ask them, they're focused on research, which we don't do here. That's part of why the teachers that teach here teach here is we don't want to do research. Yeah. It's not an interest to me. Yeah, I don't care about it at all. I'll let somebody else do it. Um, I like teaching. So um, then they see teaching as a chore to four year universities for the most part. Um, they for science, anyways, I can't speak for every department, but they see teaching as a chore. What they're really there for is the research. So it's like that, you, it's just a waste of their time, more or less, which is how it devolves into being what it has clearly at Stillwater. But um, I am, it's gonna be a- Program have got some shit they do. I, for OU? I mean, probably. What I hear, and we've talked about this, right, is that our program is pretty, still pretty strong because it like focuses on nursing more or less. Um, if you're going into vet stuff too, I did talk, we had a big like come to Jesus meeting in that class, but um, some of my vet tech students talking about how we don't talk enough in regard to um, the vet tech stuff. I am going to be trying to modify the course to accommodate that a little bit more. You know, um, I know I talk a lot about human diseases because that's what I know and that's what I'm excited in and that's what gets me excited to teach you guys. But if you are vet uh, students, I'm gonna let you know, you know, for future generations, um, you guys have, I won't say directly, some of you indirectly inspired me to try to focus a little more on the, every semester I do it more and more, to be clear, like it didn't used to be, and have this much vet stuff in it, sadly, but, um, cause it's not, it's not fair to you guys. You're not, it's not just nursing, right? Um, this is meant to be a microbiology. If I didn't make that clear in the beginning of the semester, this is meant to be a microbiology that transfers between all universities for any reason, whether you're a major in microbiology or you're nursing or you're going into, you know, paramedic or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, even if like the PA, it doesn't matter. Whatever reason you're taking microbiology for, it's supposed to transfer between all schools. I had to explain that to the, those students yesterday too, because they were like, well, this is, you know, for nursing students, why do we have to learn all this stuff? And I'm like, well, I mean, I know I'm gearing it mostly towards nursing, but I can't cut out like some of the more difficult stuff because if a micro major rolls through here, it has to transfer credits between other universities. Um, it's required by the state that I do that, not by me. So um, that's a regulated thing that if they were to check on it, which clearly they're not because the classes aren't at all similar to one another, but if they were, um, we can get, we can lose our accreditation for stuff like that. So that's a pretty serious thing. Um, but yeah, part of that is transfer credits. So, uh, but yeah, but that's kind of also why I wanna talk to OSU Stillwater because I was on that uh, transfer credit committee and um, part of it is we have to talk about what topics you're teaching. They have to be the same and how you're, te how you're testing and stuff is supposed to be streamlined, but it clearly is so vastly different that I'm gonna talk to them. And the least we can do is um, make it similar between the OSU system, if not um, statewide, but like, I might even, I'm one of those people like, they, people don't care about OSU OKC, like to the level that it's like, oh, okay, you know, this person's who cares about OSU OKC faculty. But I passed quite well as a student. So uh, if I have to go audit the class, I will. Um, that's how that's gonna be. And then I'll make notes and bring it back to the Dean um, here. And uh, we can talk with our uh, interim um, uh, provost uh, and see what they think about that. Because it's just, it's not supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to be so you know, different. You're supposed to be able to like take it. And it's hard here. It might be a little less hard there, a little less hard here, but like, geez, man, like from what I'm hearing, it's just like, so different. Um, have you guys ever have complaints about anything like that that you notice? Because we don't always notice that unless you guys bring it up to us. Um, you don't have to bring it up to us. You can always talk to an advisor or something like that and, and get movement going on there because that's not fair. Especially, um, it's just weird, right? You guys are paying less for this class than um, what they're paying for at Stillwater. And I guess they're paying more just to basically buy an A. Um, they don't have to learn really a whole lot in their classes. And you guys are coming here and paying less and working your asses off to pass this class. That shouldn't work that way. So, um, you know, I think every semester I'm trying to make it easier, but still cover my material. And apparently there's people out there that are basically like watering it down to the point of not having to even really learn, just memorize a few terms. I'm like, what is that going to do for you when you get into, you know, nursing situations or whatever? Also, just to be clear, the person who's complaining about the vet tech stuff was like, 
what does this even apply to somebody going into that? Like, none of this even applies to me. I'm like, have you been paying attention? Because we talk about like heart lungs. We've talked about, you know, even that day we had somebody present about kettle cough and we've talked about all sorts of stuff. Um, I feel like understanding about what a bacterium is, if you guys came to this class, most of you guys probably didn't really have a good grasp on what bacteria were versus viruses versus all this stuff. And you probably have a, at least a general concept of it now. That's what this class is for. Um, and I th do think that those concepts are important for anybody going into any kind of healthcare, human or animal. Um, you know, if we're talking about iguanas, for example, uh, if you're going to be working in, you know, a veterinary program, for those of you that don't know, I mean, they're rampant with salmonella. You should probably have an idea about what salmonella is and how, what that's about. So stuff like that. It's not all as simple as puppies and kittens. That's, if y'all are going into vet tech and you think it's all puppies and kittens, hate to break it to you, especially if you're in the OSU system. OSU tends to focus quite heavily on ag, not on, you know, puppies and kittens. So get ready for horses and cows. Yeah, my mom brings her kangaroo to the vet just to hang up. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You're, 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 yeah, you might re meet uh, Rachel's mom and get yeah, to see her menagerie. Good yeah, luck. she's on. So whatever. So I guess you guys got a little bit of that breakdown. But um, I, I do listen and I do hear and I care a lot more probably than you guys think. All right, let me see. We have today. I can't figure out how to do italics. Yeah, don't worry about it. So I'm not going to count off for italics because I haven't figured out how to, I tried to figure out when I was making the PDF document how to make that an option and I'm not smart enough with making it. Additionally, there is like on the gram negative side, if you try to type into uh, endospore or into acid fast, they're kind of like one window for that and it'll populate, if you put NA into that one window, it'll populate into both of those. It should just be that spot that does that, but we didn't do um, gram negative for either of those tests. So just put NA in there and it'll populate NA and then you're good to go. So just FYI, I had some people um, having issues with that. So that's okay. All right, um, Kiki, <laughs> do you wanna to try to come and log into your thing while we're still chatting about this stuff? I'm assuming you need to be on the internet for this. Yeah. All right. Let's we'll log into that. Um, but yeah, today in lab, what we're going to do is, of course, do the octase and the catalyst test, um, and then um, the nitrate thing. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, that's going to be a little tricky. It's a tricky, but that's just under pre levels. Most people have that kind of here. Um, then you get an idea now, probably, what I'm talking about. The trickiness with the red being positive and then negative, right? Depending on what, what the so, um, we'll see how that works out. I drew a diagram on the board. We'll go over it while we're testing it and everything. Hopefully it'll make sense. Um, that one, I have usually just one question about the nitrate on the test. So keep that in mind. It might be a little bit of a forgiving. More like, you know, one stage about it. But um, it'll be like, you know, we added zinc. And then now it's this color. Is it positive or negative or whatever? So hopefully that's all we really can work out. Is the lab final 50 as well? Yes, yeah, the lab so. final is quite a lot like the midterm. So it'll just have to add it in. We won't have any eukarya questions. So I feel like we can knock that all out. I would require for the midterm. We won't have any of that. So it's just going to be staying, um, microscope part, safety, and um, the new two stuff in place. It's comprehensive, but no eukaryotes. I don't know. It's just a lot. Really. Eukaryotes stuff. Just a lot of weird slides that like, you guys didn't even make. I kind of remember what they look like. It's long. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Good? Okay. I'll let you go first since we already have your stuff pulled up. Okay. Here we go. All right, my presentation was on hepatitis A. Let's get started with what causes hepatitis A. It's caused by the hepatitis A virus, which is a small non-envelope RNA, which belongs to the picornavidia family. Thank you for coming. I tried so hard. Now, what makes this virus such a troublemaker? Well, the virulence factors are quite impressive. H HAV has this 
remarkable ability to survive harsh acidic environment of the stomach, which is really rare for a virus. Not only that, but it can also live in that bad environment for quite some time, just waiting to cause trouble. Once it gets into your system, it heads straight to your liver and sets up in hepatokite, causing inflammation and all sorts of chaos. How does HIV spread? This is where things get interesting and kind of gross. The primary transmission is through fecal to oral routine, which is like someone didn't wash their hands after using the bathroom and then they go and they make your food. Um, that's how things can kind of go downhill quickly. So food and water sources are the main contaminant for this virus. Let's talk about when someone actually gets sick. At first, it, you just have flu-like symptoms like uh, aches and pains and fevers, but then it can escalate pretty quickly to jaundice in the eye and skin, dark urine and pale poop. But these symptoms sound pretty scary, but in reality, it is just your body trying to fight off the virus. And when it comes to diagnosing, it's important to rule out other causes of viral hepatitis. Hepatitis, so differential diagnosis are the key. Um, this is just a microscopic view of HAV. Um, it is surrounded by the capsid, which is like its protective shell. And then you have the SSRNA, which is like the instruction manual. You also have the virus's little helpers, which is gonna be the Viral protein genome link assists the RNA replication, while the PVVP, VP4, helps with the virus attached to attach and enter the host cell. Um, all of these things are important because they play a crucial role in how hepatitis A has this life cycle. From invading our cells to replicating generic materials, every step is orchestrated by these tiny structures. Understanding that gives us insight into how the virus works and ultimately how we can combat it. Um, when it comes to diagnosing HIV, we have a few tricks up our sleeve, serological tests, liver function tests, and the PCR test. Some of these, uh, these are just some of the tools that we use. We can detect specific antibodies and viral RNA in the blood, confirming whether someone has acute hepatitis A. Um, the care for someone who's been diagnosed with hepatitis A, supportive care is crucial, so rest, hydration, and nutritional food. You can also provide symptomatic treatment that would help with the nausea, vomiting, and fever, but the most important tool is actually the prevention. That's where the vaccines come into play. The hepatitis A vaccine is incredibly effective at preventing infection, infections, especially for children's. People who travel to places where Hep A is common um, and individuals at risk. For those who have been exposed to the virus, there's something called the post exposure prophylaxis, <laughs> which involves giving immunoglobulin to provide temporary protection if administered within two weeks of exposure. The bottom line of hepatitis A, the good news is it's not usually something to panic about. Most people recover without complications and hep A doesn't stick around to cause chronic issues or turn anyone to a carrier. But that doesn't mean we should take it lightly. Practicing good hygiene, like washing your hands and being mindful of where you eat and drink is crucial for prevention. And remember outbreaks can still happen. That is why vaccination campaigns and public health efforts are important to check in. <laughs> You should tell, you should, um, I don't know, I'm she uses Prezi. Yes, it's Prezi. I have to look into how it works because that worked out really cool. Yeah, I... Was it easy to figure it out? Yeah, I used it in like high school. Okay. And so anytime I have to make a presentation, it's really simple. You can customize it here and then you have your certain frames and then you can control when the pictures come in and out. And honestly, I would just make it on like a PDF and then slap the pictures and stuff in here. It took me like 30 minutes to get together on this screen. Yeah. Thanks for sharing.
of course. I don't know how to log out. Can I just exit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you guys just <laughs> you don't want to feel my presence anymore? Yeah. <laughs> right. All righty. All right, Natalie, are you ready? No. <laughs> Gotta love the helmet diseases. I think they're so like terrifying. Yeah. All right. And she'd be good to click or just arrows or roll um, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie. And I will be talking about trichomolosis, and it is a parasite. There are seven different types, or seven species, sorry, of trichinolosis. The main or the classical agent is trichinolosis viralis, uh, and it is caused by a helmet, the roundworm, the nematodes, sorry. <laughs> there are, they insist, two of them do not, um, Pseudosporalysis is found in mammals and birds, and that one does not insist. Neither does the T. Pape. I don't know if I pronounced that properly. Yeah, I don't know these guys. I always just talk about like um, Trichinella and then I just. The main one, yeah. the classical agent. Yeah. And that one is found in New Guinea and Thailand, and that one does not insist. The last one is also interesting. Zimbabwensis is found in crocodiles in Africa, but that one is not associated with human disease. So it was interesting learning about them. Uh, let's see. The virulence factors. What's scary about these is the females produce a very high number of larvae. They can produce about 500 to 1,000 within the span of two to six weeks. Um, if it is not caught early on, it can obviously cause a ton of issues in our body. The larvae released from the cyst will invade host muscle cells, uh, which can lead to tissue damage and inflammation. And the severity of it also depends on where they insist or which muscle tissue they make it to. Um, they travel throughout the bloodstream and insist in our muscle cells. They can also, in this stage, they can survive in our tissue for many years. One case I was reading, I, I don't honestly don't even know how they were able to figure that out, but it says they can last up to 11 years in our muscle tissues. And the adults, it yeah. is. The adults are protected by a tough outer layer. It is a zoonotic disease, and it is well. You can obtain it by consuming raw or undercooked meat. After exposure, it uh, it goes into our intestinal intestines. Sorry, and the acid in our intestines destroys the outer layer of it, and that's what causes them to kind of go out and spread about. They, so it sort of activates them to be in like the gut? Yeah, and that's where they start. And then they go, get into the bloodstream and spread out throughout the body. The females are about 2.2 millimeters in length and the males are smaller, 1.2 millimeters in length. After about a week, the females will release the larvae and that's when they go out through the bloodstream and go into the muscle tissues. And then these are just the facts I share. They can stay there up to 11 years and the females produce 500 to 1000 larvae over a period of two to six weeks. Risk factors again are consuming raw or undercooked meat, especially pork or wild game uh, for humans. So some suggestions are to cook whole beefs, veal, pork, and lamb to at least 145 degrees, wild game to 160 degrees. Uh, use a meat thermom thermometer. You can also, um, oh, sorry. And they suggest not microwaving raw meat. I don't know why anyone would do that, but <laughs> that, that is there. Do not microwave raw meat. 
because it doesn't distribute heat evenly. So it might not get to everything, unfortunately. Um, if you're using meat grinders, make sure you're cleaning them thoroughly afterwards. Wash your hands properly, obviously, when you're cooking and handling the raw meat. Smoking, curing, pickling, the raw meat does not kill. Animals are at risk when they're eating other infected animals, when they're eating garbage that has infected meat scraps or through water as well. And that's mostly for birds. Symptoms and signs usually appear within one to two weeks after consuming the infected meat. And what makes it tough about it is that there aren't any symptoms that will specifically say it's, it's trichinolosis. So you have to narrow it down like many other things. And, but the initial symptoms are diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Later, once there are more um, cysts in the muscle, there's muscle pain, swelling, fever, fatigue, facial edema, well, sorry, myalgia, splinter hemorrhages, and peripheral eosinophilia, and headaches as well. If it becomes life-threatening with large manifestations, there can be myo myocarditis, central nervous system involvement, and pneumonitis. Can also cause other gastrointestinal, sorry, infections and muscle disorders. The diagnosis is usually made sero ser well, serologically or based on observation of the larvae in muscle tissue following biopsy to auto biopsies. The diagnostic methods, um, they obviously look for the clinical symptoms. Eosinophilia plus laboratory tests can confirm trichinolosis by detecting specific antibodies or larvae in the body. Again, muscle biopsy or stool samples. But unfortunately, they, they will not show up in the enzyme in immunoassays until three to five weeks post infection. So it can get tricky. Patient care treatments and vaccines. The treatments are really only to relieve symptoms because there isn't a vaccine specifically for it. Some of the medications are abendazole or mebendazole to kill the, are prescribed, sorry, to kill the adult worms. If the infestation is severe, the patient will need several rounds. Analgestics to relieve the pain, corticosteroids to manage severe infections, and again, no specific vaccine, vaccine sorry, are available. Other pertinent information, trichinolysis is a global wide disease. Um, having awareness of food safety, proper practices, and cooking techniques can significantly reduce the infection. And then it can also lead to severe complications, again, like myocarditis, encephalitis, and pneumonia. And also another interesting fact I found was the CDC conducted research from 2011 and 2000 to 2015 the highest rate of cases were found in Alaska. I'm guessing maybe because of all the wild game out there. Um, and I did not include many pictures, sorry, but I did not eat meat for two weeks after I did this. I to convince myself I can No, you're like, you get horrible rashes. The eyes look horrible. On some, you can see like the warm in the eye. And those are the severe cases. So you walk on the, re I, st I still get the chills thinking about it. But. Okay. So for those of you who aren't aware, if you're ever, you know, told to always cook your pork thoroughly, pork is not one of those meats that you eat even medium or something like that, this is the reason why it's this. So just, you know. I actually have like a family friend, he was affected by this with the pork. Yeah, and that was crazy. Right. Oh man. So he's not the same. Yeah. We were able to, to 
treated, but he was not the same. It was. That's yeah, I bet that's crazy. I've never thought, I never really thought about that part of it, but it makes sense. Okay, so we are on. I had a friend who was a dumbass and ate uncooked bacon because he was Canadian bacon. <laughs> <laughs> He's not very bright. So, a review of the last chapter, real quick what uh, type of pathogen causes whooping cough? The type of pathogen, that's a bacterium. Right. Um, antigenic shift. That's whenever we have reassortment of the pieces of the flu genome within um, a single host uh, between two different kinds of virus to make a new virus that comes out. What which pathogen is the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia? Streptococcus pneumoniae. Is Streptococcus pyogenes gram positive or is it gram negative? It's a gram positive. Is it Streptococcus? All of them are gram positive. Um, what type of pathogen causes sinus infections? Most commonly, it's going to be viruses, but it can be viruses, it can be bacteria, it can be fungal, it can be a lot. So, cool. All right, we uh, kind of have an idea of the GI tract, basically how things are going to get into the, the mouth, into the GI tract. What happens in the mouth, of course, dealing with the salivary glands? I'm moving down the esophagus into the stomach and then through um, stomach to the small intestine and then to the large intestine and then through the rectum and then finally the anus on its way out. And we have accessory organs like the liver, the gallbladder and the pancreas that are helping with processing food, like producing enzymes and stuff like that. There is mucus, of course, lining the surfaces inside of all of these. We have secretory IgA as well. That's always gonna be there if there are mucous membranes. Peristalsis is that smooth muscle movement to keep everything moving through. Um, if that is disrupted somehow and things are allowed to sit there for a while, then we are risking infection, which is actually an issue if you do have like diverticulitis and you develop little crypts inside of the large intestine that can trap food and stuff in there and then lead to infection, which is um, another thing of what they think happens with appendicitis as well. Um, saliva contains lysosome, which is going to affect the peptidoglycan of the bacterial cell wall, as well as lactoferrin, which removes um, iron from being used by the bacteria. Stomach has a very low acidic pH. Bile is antimicrobial in and of itself. And then we have the GALT, which is the gut associated lymphoid tissue, which um, works very similar to what you know lymph uh, nodes would be doing, but a widespread tissue in the whole area. Um, for starting out with the uh, biota of the mouth, the oral microbiome, um, this is dominated mostly by bacteria. We have, um, you know, methane producing archaea, which live in the mouth, which is newly discovered, that's newly been associated with decay in the teeth. Um, then we have fungi, a few protozoa. When we say fungi, we're mostly talking about yeasts, right? So candida albicans, of course, you know, you can get thrush uh, if that overpopulates. We have a couple of protozoa species that can be found in there as well. And the virome, or how many viruses can be found in that area, or in any of the biome of the whole body, is still being studied and looked into, and its importance, whether or not that's a thing. So um, we have the esophagus and stomach having their own organisms. Most of them are going to be the firmicutes, so having the, that's the gram-positives, right? Having a thick cell wall. Um, the large intestine has, this one is very impressive, 10 to the 11, right? So that is a one with 11 zeros after it. That's a lot per gram of what's in your gut, in your large intestine. That's not very much, right? A gram is about a cc. So typically when we're talking about liquid. So take that small amount, just, just a gram of something, um, and uh, that many microbes. And that's not surprising. Of course, we know what's going on in the gut, but still like really puts it into perspective there, especially when we'll be learning about these guys. So this will be bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. Probably viruses are there as well. It's just a lot going on in those microbes. Um, we think the accessory organs like the liver and the pancreas should be free of a microbiome in general. So these are uh, protective. Um, they do teach our immune system to react appropriately to things while we're growing up and they help aid in digestion. So this is probably where the biome is the most important. It doesn't just serve as protective as what we can see with, we talked about the respiratory system. We said it has a biome. One of the, if you guys haven't played the Kahoot for it, one of the questions on the Kahoot is regarding, um, you know, what's the purpose of the biome of the respiratory tract? Well, if you have a biome anywhere in the body, 
one of the purposes it serves is microbial antagonism. So being protective, taking up the stadium seats, right? If there are good guy bacteria there and they are sitting in stadium seats, that's helping to be protective in that way to you. So don't forget that that's always there if you do have a biome in that area. So we definitely do in the GI tract, right? These are just the other ones that they can do, teaching our urine immune system to behave, aiding in digestion, and it's associated with overall health. We've been learning quite a lot about that um, just as a society lately, like science um, every day is finding out something new about how your gut biome has something to do with your mental health or um, how likely you are to gain weight or lose weight or be more athletic and all these things relating to the biome in your own gut. So I'm imagining that eventually someday there will be a way to like reset your biome essentially safely without having to go in surgically or have radiation or anything like that. And then you would be able to like take a poop pill basically that repopulates your gut with actual healthy ideal bacteria. I'm imagining that's probably sometime within a lifetime. But we'll really that. <laughs> what do you mean? Like it would look like poop or something. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Well, I don't see it happening for the whole entire body necessarily, but for the gut, like if you can clear out the gut, maybe with um, antibiotic, uh, you know, enema or a treatment with, um, usually would do that now with high strength antibiotics. Like if you had C. diff, um, they can treat you with antibiotics that will clear out everything in your gut, but they have to replace it with something, which would be a fecal transplant now. Um, they could do something like that to make it easier and more streamlined. I can see it being like a clinic type of a thing. You can go to like the biome clinic or something, mm -hmm. have, a, have a treatment like that. And then they'd send you home with like a pill to take 24 hours later to repopulate whatever, or a yogurt that you eat or something like that, that to help populate, or even a suppository probably more likely, but yes. Professor Smith told us that whenever you have, you're missing an appendix and you, if you go through chemo radiation, you look forward to go back to you to get a little pill from one of your family members filled with their fecal matter and either ingest it or have it shoved up your rectum mm -hmm. to repopulate. Yeah, they That's think insane. they think that that might may be one benefit of having an appendix, right? Because it holds on to the bacteria that you have as part of your normal biome. So like if you don't have it anymore and you do for whatever reason have a lot of antibiotics for something or whatever, there's no like little pocket of your biome to like repopulate your gut. So that makes a lot of sense. Like you're, so interesting. It's great. It's cool. <laughs> that was cool. That was I like Dr. Smith a lot. He has a lot of interesting stories. He's always got a story. So, <laughs> so anyways, um, but yeah, the gut is a lot more important than you might think. So, um, and it's becoming more and more understood every day or maybe even less and less understood because we're finding more about how the things that it can do. So I, I just think it's pretty impressive, it's function. So to start with the most, A number one, definitely gonna be a question on the test, okay? The most common infectious disease of, all, of human beings of all time is dental caries. This is tooth decay, okay? So not a surprise at all. And you don't have to have a full on cavity here. We're just talking about any sort of tooth decay whatsoever. So if you have bacteria in your mouth that have you know, degraded your teeth in any way, reduced your enamel. If you have sensitive teeth now, probably because dental caries, right? So um, anyways, it's dis dissolution of the tooth surface because the bacteria are fermenting on your tooth surface. We know one of the byproducts of fermentation, acid. So they're making acid and other products that are eating through the enamel on your teeth over time and then causing damage eventually to deeper layers if that continues. So um, disruption of the enamel, then the deeper layers. This is usually associated with streptococcus mutans and uh, streptococcus sobrinus. These are the two that are associated with it. Um, usually associated with carbohydrate um, consumption, not surprising there. We learn about the importance of carbohydrates in fermentation and that's the whole thing. What will happen is you'll develop a biofilm on your teeth. I can't even look at this picture. So um, <laughs> they'll have a biofilm on your teeth and um, they'll just, you know, sit there and grow and be happy with their little capsules and slime layers and, and growing off one another and um, quorum sensing with one another, uh, telling each other how things are going around each other and all that. And then um, when you go into the dentist to have your teeth cleaned, they can scrape off the plaque that isn't being removed by typical traditional brushing. This is why we floss as well to try to get what was between your teeth that your brush can't get to so that we're not building up too much of this. If you are keeping up with regular brushing and flossing and going to your dentist you know, at least once a year to get a cleaning, if not twice a year, um, 
then you should be more than safe from, um, you know, true cavities and other issues, as long as you have a relatively normal biome. Now, some of us have certain types of organisms in our biome that are going to make you more susceptible to having tooth decay um, getting more severe. I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, we're moving on to periodontitis and, and gingivitis. Gingivitis is going to be the swelling and redness of the gums. If you floss and you have bleeding associating when flossing, um, that's because you have gingivitis. That is the reason that, that happens. That's the reason. If you're having that and you're like, oh, it's not gingivitis, it is, honey. Sorry. Um, to move past the denial. <laughs> um, so, trying to move past the denial, you have gingivitis. Um, and does it hurt? Yes. Um, are you bleeding when you do it? Yes. If you can make it through a week of just keeping up every night flossing, I can almost guarantee you that it'll stop bleeding. Um, if you're still having problems, even have to come and push through that and it's not getting better at all and it's still red and still sore and still bleeding, that's time to go to the dentist and go figure out what's really going on because your gingivitis should clear up within a week of you know, nightly flossing. And then I promise you it won't hurt or anything where you can just floss like to your little heart's content. I, when I floss, floss every night. And I don't, it doesn't hurt at all. It doesn't matter what floss you give me. I don't bleed. I don't have swelling because I floss regularly. I don't have biofilms on there that my teeth have, my gums have been getting irritated in response to. The reason you get that, you get the swelling, you get the redness, and therefore the bleeding associated with all that inflammation because your body is reacting against the bacteria that you have packed up against the gums. And that's what's going on. So that's what gingivitis is. Um, eventually, uh, that inflammation what can lead to bone loss and even eventually tooth loss if that is left to go for too long and that's what periodontitis is so it's um you'll have your gingiva which is your gum you develop this calculus which is the built up of the bacteria that is irritating physically as well as um immune wise due to that inflammation you get spaces that will develop that pocket can allow for more bacteria and therefore more inflammation and whatever and eventually that becomes um, worse and worse and worse all around that too the bone, which we can see over here in this image. Here, that bone encased within it is now also being degraded away as a result of the presence of that inflammation. And so um, you would have bloody gums, the uh, receding gum line. And um, if the bone starts to go away, it, it, that's a kind of permanent destruction that is being caused. But if you're just having gingivitis, um, so some bleeding whenever you're flossing, but you, it's otherwise you've been keeping this under control. Maybe your gums receded a little bit. If you start to go back to flossing and you had some recession of your gums, you can have the gums come back to where they go if you start flossing again. So, um, anyways, if you this is what I was talking about, uh, methano brevibacter oralis. This is actually an archaea. If you have this, you're a lot more likely to have issues with tooth decay. So here we're talking about tooth loss or needing to have root canals or we're more likely to have cavities and all this stuff, no matter how much you brush, floss, mouth wash, all of that stuff. This is more um, of an issue than anything, which by the way, I am a big fan of a mouth wash. And um, I use, they just came out with this new one. I think it was Crest, but I think people don't quote me on that. And it's called like Bacteria Blast. I don't know how I feel about that marketing name, but um, it just it has a picture of like teeth and like this big old like wash, like background or whatever. It's called Taco Bell. <laughs> Taco Bell, right. Yeah. So it's uh, one of those, one of those though that, um, yeah, it really doesn't sound like you're gonna get experience with it, but it is one of the um, uh, hydrogen peroxide based ones. So I usually don't like them because they get so foamy in your mouth but this one's not quite as bad and it has a much mintier, fresher taste. So I highly recommend it. My favorite mouthwash so far. So try it out if you're in a mouthwash. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be like a Listerine girl, but there's so much burn associated with that. I like a little burn and this one has like kind of the best of both worlds. It's a little bit of burn, but it's also got that hydrogen peroxide and the hydrogen peroxide is really good for keeping your teeth white, by the way. Um, but anyways, since I have, I have fake teeth in like my front teeth, they can't be whitened past what color the fake teeth are. So I can't have whitening toothpaste like has no purpose really for me um, because it's just not gonna whiten my fake teeth. So if you guys don't know that if you have fake teeth like caps on your teeth or something, they can't whiten past the color that they were made. So don't bother trying. Um, it's just gonna be frustrating. 
Anyway, so that's a good one if you like a mouthwash. I found it like a month ago and I just, I've already repurchased it like once and you know that's a, that's a good sign because I usually try to wash mouthwashes all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, anyways, yeah, 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 yeah. So based on your behavior, so behavior here we're talking about like maybe um, things that you're eating or how you eat or when you brush, um, you have genetic influences how your teeth are positioned. If you have a lot of overlap of your teeth and you're not getting in there very well when you're brushing, for example, um, pockets um, on your teeth, if you grind your teeth, um, presence of plaque on there, all leading to whether or not you're gonna have the development of periodontitis. So clearly this person has quite a lot of periodontitis going on. You can see the irregularity of the gum lines um, that's associated with the calculus, which is the plaque that's developed on the teeth um, and the re recession of the gum in some areas as well. All right, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and periodontitis. You are welcome that I don't have a picture of this one. <laughs> this is trench mouth. Um, this is poor dental health associated with World War One. If you guys ever thought about the dental health of anybody in World War One, <laughs> but um, this is um, Treponema uh, vincentia, this is uh, Prevotella intermedia and Fusobacterium species. We talked about Fusobacterium uh, necro necroforum, I believe, in the uh, sore throat section with the peritonsillar abscesses and all that. It's the same one. So anyways, these guys uh, being present in the mouth can lead to very uh, fast uh, necrosis, basically, of the um, gingiva and uh, the bone associated with it. And it's just hor it's a horrible. There will be pseudomembrane formation, which is like a membrane formed by the bacteria themselves disgusting. So yeah, mumps, um, if you guys heard of mumps, measles, mumps, rubella, right? So here we'll go back at the mumps part of this. This is associated with the GI system because it affects your salivary glands, it's part of your GI system. So your salivary glands will get so swollen on usually just one side, but it'll get so swollen, it'll look like a gopher occurrence on that side of the face. Other symptoms will be fever, nasal discharge, muscle pain, and malaise. And we do of course have, um, uh, vaccine for this. Uh, the virus itself can migrate into the ovaries, the testes, the thyroid, the pancreas, the meninges, the heart, and the kidney. If, um, and in about 20 to 30% of adult males that are actually infected with this, it will locate to the testes um, and kind of stay there. Infection will localize there. Um, it doesn't cause sterility when it does this, but the virus will kind of hang out there. Um, what it's worth, I don't know, but all right, we know about gastritis being primarily, if you guys didn't know this, ulcers are caused by bacteria most of the time, right? About 50% of the world carries this bacteria just normally. This is Helicobacter pylori. And if you have an ulcer, it's almost always gonna be caused by this bacteria. Um, so it lives in your actual stomach. It likes the acidity and everything like that. So um, it's easily treated. There's a special, it has urea. Okay, so this has urease. And we learned about urease in lab, right? With the, the pink broth, you know, if I change pink, it meant you've made ammonia and whatever. Well, what they can do is you can go to the doctor. If you are having ulcers or you think you're having pain in your stomach, go to the doctor. And they'll have you drink this special drink that's radioactive. That's radioactive carbon. Carbon, radioactive carbon, like carbon-13, is not really bad for you. You have it naturally in your body in a certain amount, but they have more of it in the drink. So it's not going to harm you, but it is a tag. And what you'll do is you'll sit there, you'll drink that, and like in an hour, what you'll do is breathe into this bag, and if they find carbon-13 in the bag, what it means is the carbon dioxide from breaking down that urea into the um, ammonia and then carbon dioxide is the other product. We didn't test for that in our test, but it is. That carbon dioxide will be laced with that um, carbon-13 radioactive. And they can test the air that you breathed out from that little baggie for, is that not the weirdest and coolest thing all at the same time? I had to have that test done once when I was having stomach pain. Um, I tested negative, but like, yeah, you breathe into the bag, you drink the drink, and then you breathe into the bag again, and they compare the carbon-13 levels of them and then determine if you have it that way. That's how they diagnose it now. All right, so acute diet. Let's talk, oh, right, diarrhea. This whole, pretty much most of this chapter is diarrhea and worms. So just, <laughs> okay, diarrhea. So let's do this. Acute diarrhea, this is going to be three or more loose stools within a 24-hour period. Um, typically, we're talking about maybe no longer than two weeks of diarrhea, but most of these acute cases are going to be like three days tops, right? Maybe a week. Um, this is usually going to be contaminated food. Um, we, we see this more in, of course, developing countries than we do here. 
top five causes of foodborne illness, the A number one is going to be norovirus, right? And then we have salmonella, we have C. perfringens, we have Campylobacter, and we should already know C. perfringens. We saw C. perfringens. Do you guys remember where we've seen this before? That's going to be the skin. That's going to be gas gangrene. So, but it's also um, produces toxins associated with food poisoning. So there's that one, Campylobacter, um, and then Staph aureus. So again, another um, one that's food poisoning that we've seen before associated with skin diseases. But, and we've heard of salmonella. You may not think that you've heard of Campylobacter, but it is super common. So um, people just don't think about it. But if you're, if you're gonna die from your foodborne illness, the thing that's gonna kill you is more likely gonna be salmonella, then maybe toxoplasma, then listeria, then norovirus, and then Campylobacter. So let's talk about salmonella. We use the flagella capsule and the cell wall um, including the LPS, which is the endotoxin, to identify all of our enterobacter um, bacteria, basically anything in the gut. So we, we can use those as identifiers and tell the difference between them. So that's the HKOs there. I'm not going to test you on which one is which, but just you know, be aware that those are all used. And remember that flagella and um, the capsule, those are virulence factors. And you could even say potentially that the endotoxin or LPS is a virulence factor as well for all gram negatives. But Almost all of these, all of these enteric bacteria are going to be gram negative, um, most of them. So salmonella, um, here it's telling you it has produces H2S but not urease, and it is going to survive pretty well in lab environments. Salmonellosis is whenever you get uh, just basic diarrhea from salmonella, um, and it, I don't know, it's kind of mild. You'll recover just fine from it. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea, maybe some mucosal irritation, maybe fever and septicemia if it progresses. But then we have typhoid fever, which is salmonella type typhi. So we call it salmonella typhi, but they're all salmonella enterica. They're just types of them that we call one or the other. But typhi, this is typhoid fever. This is a typhoid Mary. When we talk about typhoid Mary spreading around and not washing her hands, this is what we're talking about. So here we have a much uh, more severe uh, presentation of the disease with this, and it has a higher um, likelihood to, to kill and a lower need um, for infection. Next, we have Shigella. You've heard of Shigella or Shigellosis. This is a pretty common foodborne disease. It is gram negative. These guys are rods. They are non-motile. And the reason I have put this kind of highlighted it in gray is um, because I'm gonna compare it to E. coli, which is motile. We should, I think most of us know by now that um, E. coli is motile, but Shigella is not. And that's one of those big defining differences. Shigella dysenteriae obviously causes dysentery. And we remember that is bloody diarrhea. Okay? Dysentery is bloody diarrhea. Um, and other symptoms that you usually associate with having diarrhea, like nausea, sometimes vomiting even. Um, it has these special toxins like enter an enterotoxin. That's the toxin associated with gut bacteria. That will lead to bleeding and secretion of mucus. That's part of the diarrhea process, the um, dysentery process. And it also produces shiga toxin, which is what's going to be causing severe damage to the internal portions of the um, colon. Okay, very actually pretty serious. Here, oh yeah, you can see a picture. Can I have a picture? Normal GI tract on the left, and the shigella effect on the right. You can see the damage that's being done inside of the colon there due to that shiga toxin produced by shigella. There's another bacteria out there that produces shiga toxin that is not shigella. And that is E. coli 0157H7 or STEC. STEC stands for shiga toxin producing E. coli. When we hear about the e. Coli, out, e. coli outbreaks and like how severe they are and how stop eating the spinach and all of this stuff, it's this, it's STEC. This is what they're primarily concerned about if we're testing your food for E. coli. Now, my lab that I worked in tested for E. coli. It shouldn't be there at all, right? But if it did pop positive, sometimes the companies want to know, is it S-TECH? Um, is that, because that's a more, more serious concern. So they would have us test that afterwards. Uh, pretty, pretty expensive to test for, but. Um, um, I mean, maybe like once every three weeks or something. I mean, it really wasn't like very, we'd see like maybe, some places just ordered it regularly though. So I will say that. When it actually popped positive for STEC, I only seen it twice for the whole year or two. Maybe it was there for two years. Maybe it was two years that I worked there. 
Um, but yeah, it's just not, it's not common. I mean, and whenever we did see it, if it did pop positive, it was usually not associated with the food so much as it was with the workers who were handling it and uh, preparing it or whatever being the cause of the contamination. That was usually what it was um, and not so much the food issues. We never had to like report out somebody having like an outbreak outbreak. We were usually able to, you know, define where it came from and why and okay, we don't need to call, you know, CDC or something like that about what was going on. Not at my location anyways. So luckily there's that. And well, I mean, we did test quite big places in case you guys haven't been paying attention. I've talked about how we test McDonald's and all sorts of places like that. So it wasn't like little mom and pop shops. Um, it was mostly larger. And like food companies that provide food to like, I mean, Applebee's. Yeah, Applebee's didn't always do very good. It was usually their marinades, if I'm being honest. It did not do great. That and I'll say fruit, like we tested Dole fruit, like their frozen fruit packages, like you can about buy at the store frozen fruit. Um, they always stayed within limits, but oh my gosh, did they have mold? That's not to be, that's not to be surprised by, right? Because we've seen a strawberry, like they all have mold on them. Pretty much you can't avoid them getting moldy, but they were within limits. But man, when you culture it on purpose and see it, it's like, you don't want, I, I for a while I couldn't eat a strawberry or like, I would like almost scrub them down. <laughs> so yeah, that's the other one, but that was shocking. You see all the time on like TikTok and people trying to sell you that little like pill thing that you can put in the water that's supposed to clean uh -huh. like, veggies and stuff like that. Does that thing actually work? I, I don't know that it works any better than just like rinsing off in a colander or something, you know, I would just, I would, I don't know enough about how, how it's supposed to work. So we would have to, I'd have to watch it myself. So if you want to show it to me and get my opinion on it, I would be happy to give it. But um, yeah, definitely. I used to be a person who, before I worked with the food industry, I would just eat food. Like I go to the store and just like open it and like eat the food and like not think about it. Like I know people did wash their stuff. Like I'm just like, who are these people? I have a strong immune system, like whatever. <laughs> I never had any problems with it. But after working for testing food as a living, like that changed things. Now I am like really anal about, so rinse your food off, please. Um, yes, if so you're making- vinegar, chill it. Oh yeah, God. yeah, you can even, yes. And if you're making a salad, for example, you can even rinse it with a little bit of white vinegar to help remove any of the bacteria that could be on the leaves of the lettuce. But you can rinse off the, the vinegar if you aren't planning on having a vinegary dressing on it or something. But like, just, you know, vinegar is a very good way of, of um, dealing with those things but still being like, friendly to your body and not harmful to you. And what white vinegar or um, apple cider, white vinegar is more effective, but apple cider might be more pleasing to the palate depending on what you're looking at. Um, just FYI, it helps. So from somebody who did the testing, I'm telling you nothing is clean, <laughs> nothing is. Um, even, even testing McDonald's, like they grew plenty of stuff, believe me, it just wasn't E. coli. So for what it's worth. I don't know, but shiga toxin, man, it can be made by E. coli. Also, we know we put the difference here. E. coli is modal. So remember that shiga, they're both gram negative rods. Um, shigella is going to be non motile So that's one way you could tell if you were looking. Um, hey, E. coli, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of E. coli out there. It turns out there's a whole, whole, whole bunch of different kinds of E. coli. Uh, I'm not going to go over them. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Campylobacter, this is a bacteria associated with diarrhea and um, foodborne illness. We see this a lot um, just at home, like not cooking your uh, food enough. So this one's not super severe, but it is associated with di diarrhea. It has this nice, pretty spiral shape to it, and it is a micro aerophile. It doesn't need to have a lot of oxygen in order to live. We actually grew it in anaerobic chambers when we were growing it for testing place. Most places don't test for this, and I don't think it's even required that you do. So keep that in mind. And the exposure to that, depending on how your body reacts to it, can lead to Guillain-Barre, which is a neurological disorder. Uh, anyways, C. diff uh, can be, uh, of course, associated with uh, pseudomembranous colitis. We think of it as just colitis, which is inflammation of the colon, but it is pseudomembranous. A pseudomembrane is a membrane that is formed by the growth of the bacteria that blocks off whatever. So um, pseudomembranous colitis, um, this is... a uh, you know, blocking off the colon basically with the membrane made by the bacteria. That's the problem with C. diff. Um, we have quite severe um, presentation of colitis here and it requires um, strong treatment with antibiotics because of the presence of the endospores. 
Next is cholera. This is caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae. This is going to cause a, um, these guys are motile. They have one single flagellum. They have this curved shape to them, which is the Vibrio aspect of them. You see this associated with natural disasters for refugees. Um, and we have a special um, toxin associated with these guys that cause um, rapid, like, uh, removal of your electrolytes in your cells. So, I mean, like, you are having massive electrolyte loss. And this is what they call a rice water stool associated with this. So you get diarrhea to the point that you aren't having diarrhea so much as you are just having water just, just constantly streaming out of your body. And it looks like rice water. It has a, a whitish sort of color to it. That's the electrolytes that you're losing. It won't look like poop anymore. It won't be brown. It will be white. Uh, it's just being flat. Um, it shouldn't, um, not for cholera, um, simply because we're, you're not going to have blood associated with this one. It shouldn't be. So can you die from this? Yes, absolutely. So 55 to 70% mortality rate with this. It's hard to keep up with it because you get dehydrated so quickly. And if you're not expecting it, it can become very, very severe. Cholera is a severe diarrhea. That watery um, stool that you get, what they'll do is um, even in, um, maybe not now here in like you know, America, but even in modern times in some of these poor countries, if you were to have this, they'll lay you in what they call the cholera bed. I've told you guys about this. I think it's a hole in the butt area as a whole. And they just let you do your rice water stool into a bucket underneath until you're done. And they try to keep you hydrated. You can still take fluids. You typically aren't going to be vomiting too much from this. So you can take fluids orally, which is preferred. They want to keep your system moving and working and everything like that. Um, they can also give you IV fluids. Um, to keep up with your fluid loss and electrolyte loss. So it can keep electrolytes going. But um, but yeah, so potassium depletion, acidosis, loss of blood volume, muscle cramps because you're losing your electrolytes, severe thirst, flaccid skin, sunken eyes because you're so literally that dehydrated. Um, convulsions and coma can occur in young children. If the, if we're not keeping up with that. Most of the time you're going to die from that um, dehydration. So to that. So. That's cholera. We saw this a lot in the case of um, Haiti when we had the earthquakes and even um, get spread a little bit into the U.S. by peeps who, people who had gone to help out with it. But yeah, the toxins are what is causing all of that. Say. There's other Vibrio species that aren't that, that aren't cholera. They're usually associated with oysters and um, organisms that you may eat that are coming from water. Cryptosporidium is a protozoan. It is AP complexin, just like um, malaria. So this is a, always a parasite type of an organism. Um, they have very hardy cysts um, and they uh, can penetrate intestinal walls. Um, they are very resistant to chlorine. And this is one that I went over, if you guys haven't already looked at it, the eukaryote presentation um, that I did for the study session. When you guys look at that, if you do, um, I talk about cryptosporidium in that. But um, this is common in swimming pools. So, yeah, if you see people pooping in a public pool, that's uh, the risk no. is the risk is cryptosporidium, really, not anything else. I used to work at a indoor water park out in Clinton, mm -hmm. and all that people did whenever people pooped in the pool, like they were full grown adults, just whatever they wanted to do. Right, right. And they would just like fish it out with a little net and just add more chlorine to the water. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. You don't see, I will say you don't see cryptosporidium a lot, but if it's there, it will survive high chlorination. So it's, uh, yeah. All right. Rotavirus. This is a common viral cause of, of diarrhea. Actually, if you have diarrhea and it goes away in a couple days, it's probably rotavirus. I mean, it's the most common cause of diarrhea in general. So rotavirus. Next is norovirus. This is another diarrhea virus that is associated with cruise ships. You hear about people getting stuck on a cruise ship. There's a norovirus outbreak. People had diarrhea. You're touching doorknobs after not washing your hands well, and it gets spread around very, very quickly. It is a very low infectious dose. You only need like one to 20 viruses. Even just one virus is enough to get infected with this. Um, it is fecal oral transmission. You can get it other places. It's just um, higher incidence on cruise ships than it is outside of cruise ships. So. All right, um, here we have ones that are associated with food poisoning. The bacteria themselves are not causing an infection in the person. It's the, it's the toxin that they produce causing the symptoms for these ones, okay? You can see this with things like that are non-infectious like mushrooms or something like that um, and other toxins, but we're talking about 
you know, bacteria and stuff. So this would be staph. Staph makes a toxin that um, can make you sick within one to six hours of exposure. If you're having diarrhea or gut um, discomfort and stuff like that associated with having eaten something and it's happening within 24 hours of having eaten, it is probably not an infectious form. It's probably one of these, these uh, food poisonings. Okay? It's a toxin based. It just takes too long for bacteria to actually populate and they'll stay around for a lot longer. If you kick this within 24 hours, you have a 24 hour bug after having eaten something, it's probably a toxin, it's not an infection. So rest assured, this is super, super, super common to get staph poisoning in your food. You go, especially if you go to like family picnic or something, it's probably that. And this have Bacillus cereus. This is one that we introduced way early on in the semester where um, it has endospores, right? Can live under the um, hot lamps, usually associated with rice, uh, fried rice that's left out under um, heat heat lamp um, and leads to diarrhea that lasts about 24 hours as well. The toxins. Um, C. perfringens, our good old friend that causes gas gangrene, makes a toxin. The toxin, um, when it's consumed, can lead to um, pain, diarrhea, and nausea within eight to 16 hours of exposure and usually is gone within a couple of days. So, all right, chronic diarrhea, this is thing, anything that goes longer than 14 days. We have IBS and um, ulcerative colitis that happen naturally, but we also can have infectious causes. Um, enteroaggregative E. coli, E-A-E-C, children and people with low immune systems, and it will lead to long lasting. Um, we also have cyclospora, chiatinensis, that's a good one, um, but cyclospora is usually what they call it, um, usually associated with the long-term um, protozoan diarrhea, watery diarrhea, stomach cramps. We've already learned about Giardia lamblia. It's the same, it's just a different name for Giardia duodenalis or Giardia intestinal. It's all the same. Giardia. Well, from Giardia, you get it from water. You don't boil your water when you're camping. It looks clear. Hey, turns out now you have diarrhea for a month. It leads to abdominal pain, um, flatulence, greasy and malodorous stools. I say it all the time because I just can't, that just, just sounds so gross. I don't want to know. Um, it is maintained within the wildlife population, typically. We have also Entamoeba histolytica. We remember these from the slides, right? So these guys have enzymes that are going to um, dissolve the tissues of the host and lead to um, symptoms associated with chronic diarrhea there. Um, and then um, that would be what we would call intestinal amoebiasis, whatever. I'm not gonna, it can lead to dysentery, which is blood. Uh, and you can also exit the intestinal cavity and go to invade other areas like the liver. We've mentioned, I promise that we're going to get through at least this part, if not the um, parasites, but hepatitis, um, this is any inflammatory disease of the liver. Hepa, that's your liver. Itis, inflammation. Okay, so there's all sorts of way, different ways you can have hepatitis. There are three forms that you need to worry about. There's a whole bunch of viruses that can cause hepatitis that are called hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, whatever. Three you need to worry about are A, B, and C, okay? <laughs> so necrosis of the hepatocytes and all this stuff associated with this. We're not gonna go into too much detail, but we already talked about Hep A. Um, it's usually pretty, um, you can recover on your own. Hep B is a DNA virus that goes from DNA, makes its little mRNA copies to make its proteins, but it also uses those mRNA to make more DNA that DNA can then be inserted into your genome. So it has reverse transcriptase, even though it is a DNA. Um, and it can lead to creation of carcinoma. Anytime that you have any insertion into the genome, um, there is a risk of carcinoma happening. So cancer happening, because it disrupts the cell cycle and how the genes are oriented and all this stuff. So cancer associated with this, we do know what we have. The big important thing to remember about hepatitis B, even though it's horrible and can lead to cancer, um, once you have it, there's no treatment for this, but there is a vaccine. So please get vaccinated for it. Hep C, there is no vaccine for Hep C, but you're gonna get this from, um, you know, usually contaminated needle, blood exposures, right? This is a blood exposure one. Needle sharing and blood transfusions. Um, if you get Hep C, 75 to 85% will remain infected indefinitely. Um, uh, if you're not being uh, treatment treated with the new treatment protocol, um, your body won't clear it out in those cases, but there are treatments available for this. Uh, a couple of uh, viral treatments that are available that can clear this. You can be cured is what I'm saying. 
So get treatment. There's no vaccine for it though. All right, the helmets is ridiculous. They're ridiculous and they're horrifying, okay? They're a bigger issue in poor countries and developing countries. The best way to diagnose most of these is eosinophilia. Those eosinophils, we know the fills being our granulocytes, right? And these are the ones that are associated with um, parasites. So we'll look for a high eosinophil count, that's indicative, as well as looking in um, typically the stool for uh, any larvae, eggs, or adult worms. So those are the number one ways to identify these guys. Um, how do we prevent them? Be sure that you are um, cooking your meat or at least freezing it. Freezing can help with eliminating some of these because they can't withstand it very well because they're multicellular. There are different life cycles they can go through, whether that's you eat the egg and then it lives in your colon and then that gets out and then moves on through life cycles, whatever, that's nice. Um, there's all sorts of other ways, though, that you can get exposed. I'm not going to make you memorize these, but if you're interested in these ridiculously complicated life cycles, here they are. All right. There is Enterobius vermicularis. This is the pinworm. Um, this is whenever the children get itchy booties and scratch at it and then, um, you know, touch their mouths and reinfect themselves or other kid, kids, you know, get, you know, a lot of times this can also be transmitted through, like, sandboxes from um, kitty litter or kitty poop in the sand or wild animal poop in the sandboxes and stuff like that. Not uncommon in the United States, honestly. Yeah, we'll put a little bit of tape on the kid's booty and look at the tape the next morning. And if there's worms on it, then that's what this is. We'll take it to the doctor and give him some medicine. Next is Trichuris trichuria. This is the whip worm. Um, it only infects humans and nothing else. So we're the only true host. Um, we have massive, massive, eggs being laid in the bowel. So 3,000 to 5,000 eggs daily. Um, and then we have uh, hemorrhage of the bowel, dysentery, loss of muscle tone of the bowel, and even rectal prolapse, which can be fatal in some cases. That rectal prolapse means your booty, um, your colon is sticking out of your booty hole, okay? So it's not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> Next, we have the different tapeworms. There's a whole bunch of them. Let me be honest with you, even though I have a whole bunch of them on here, um, I'm not going to ask you about any of them except for one, but hey, here they are. Here's one that is common here in the United States. We even have them in Alaska and the Great Lakes region. Here's another one. Cool. Um, and we don't really care. So uh, ask, um, Ascaris lumbricoides. This is a giant intestinal roundworm, not a tapeworm for this one. Okay. This is the most common helminth infection in the world. This is. Look at this, and this is not an uncommon worm burden to pull out of somebody's colon if they're having a surgery. These are the adult worms, obviously. So we see what they're called, giant intestinal roundworms. Um, but yeah, they what happens is um, they can, the larvae, penetrate the intestinal wall and move into the uh, circulatory system, move into the respiratory tree. You cough up the larvae and swallow them back into the intestine so they can complete their life cycle. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you, there are images, and I didn't have any on here, of, um, of many people who are infected with this, even children, with the worms coming out of their mouth and their noses and stuff, having popped up the larger worms. But that's something that you see often. All right, so this is the tapeworm you do have to know about that I will test you about probably. Tinea solium, this is our typical tapeworm. The one that we talk about when we talk about tapeworms. It's that big, long one, up to five meters long. Um, it is distributed worldwide. We do have this here in the United States. The biggest issue is um, cysticercosis, where if you ingest the, the eggs themselves, um, separate from being in the uh, meat. So if you get exposed with um, eating meat, that's one thing. But if you take like exposure to just the eggs themselves, like some people would do maybe to lose weight, I'm just saying, um, it can migrate into the brain and create cysts in the brain that if they're broken open, lead to massive inflammation in the brain tissue. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like a massive like lumps within the brain. It's not a joke. This isn't just something that occurs in like Grey's Anatomy or something. This happens here <laughs> in the United States in real life. You don't have to travel outside of the U.S. to get exposed to this either. So please don't. Yeah, here's a, a picture of a smaller, um, but you can see quite clearly this is cirrhosis in the brain tissue here. Um, and they can get quite big, those cysts. Um, Opsithorcus sinensis and Clonorchus sinensis. We had to look at these guys under the microscope as well. These are the Chinese liver flukes. That's pretty much all you need to know about them. They can block the bile duct with their infection. That can cause some serious problems. 
Um, we already talked about trichinosis. That saves me the trouble. <laughs> schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is, is going to cause a liver disease. It's caused by schistosoma masoni and japonicum. They are not related necessarily, but they function very similar to one another. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, they invade intact skin. The larvae can get into the intact skin of your body. Like you go swimming and it gets in through your skin and they call it swimmer's itch and it'll cause a little minor rash where they're getting in through the skin. And then you have schistosomiasis. Um, you get itchiness, they, like I said, swimmer's itch, fever, chills, diarrhea, cough, um, chronic infection will eventually lead to hepatomegaly, which is enlarged liver, liver disease, and then uh, splenomegaly, which is enlarged spleen. Um, one other symptom that is very characteristic of it is bladder obstruction. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the urine related version of it in the next chapter, but yeah. Treat um, these guys with prosequantal. Okay, cool. It's usually associated with sewage water, by the way. So we don't really have this in the US, right? We treat our water, but in third world countries, they don't. And so they're pumping sewage water into the water in which they are bathing and it's like that. And then they swim in through the skin and then all that. They cloak themselves with antigen. With, um, they get into your body. They cover themselves with your body's antigens. They just grab your stuff and cover themselves so that your body can't see them. Wow. Really clever, terrifying stuff. But I think it's just crazy that that has happened. But all right, here's our question. Which factors are important when considering a person's risk for developing periodontitis? Let's bring it back to that and not forget it. But uh, yeah, that's your picture for today and we'll head up to the lab. I think that's hilarious. I don't. Okay. Okay. Just be sure that you have it to the end, honestly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I'll set a reminder at the time, and I was like, uh, I don't really want to be Don't worry about it. It shouldn't be yeah. that bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's what to do. <laughs> 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 